What is it about mountains? What is it about these pretty piles of rock and stone that attracts us and intrigues us, fascinates us, and fills us with awe? What is it about mountains that catches the eye and captures the soul? They are connecting points between earth and sky, the pinnacles of our planet, spires created by nature that dwarf and humble any work of man. Whether we strive to scale them or admire them from afar, they give us a perspective that we can find nowhere else. While science has solved many of the mysteries of our life on Earth, we can still be intrigued by the wonders of what lies over the next ridge or what sights might be seen from a mountaintop. Mountains remind us how fleeting is our passage on this planet. These peaks have been here since long before any man walked upon this land. Fifty million years ago, the Rockies erupted from the Earth. Yet as timeless as they seem, the Rockies too are aging, heated by a scorching summer sun, chilled by a bitter winter wind. These rocks and stones expand and shrink, crack and crumble. The fluid force of wind and water conspire with the relentless tug of gravity to pull down these geologic giants. Just a few inches every thousand years may be worn away, but after millions and millions of years, these mountains will someday be leveled. So they are reminders that nothing is eternal on this earth, that life is both fleeting and fragile. Delicate alpine tundra can be destroyed in an instant by a careless hiker. It can take hundreds of years for these sensitive plants to recover. That too is a lesson, the tenacity of all living things to cling to life no matter what the challenge is. These mountains are filled with lessons if we seek them. It is a search that is its own reward. Hello, I'm Roger Wolf, and this, this is Rocky Mountain National Park. It's one of the best places on the planet to learn about the allure of the mountains, why these high places have always been such an inspiration to painters and poets, philosophers, photographers, and musicians. When I'm up on a place like this, not only can I see all the beautiful scenery, but I can see lots of wonderful memories from up here because every summit you can see from up here, I've been on top of, and some of them many times, and with different people in different times of the year. And so it's just a lot of beautiful memories, and that's something nobody can take away from you. At the age of 72, Jim Disney continues to challenge himself as he tackles the trails of Rocky Mountain National Park, a place he knows so well he simply calls it Rocky. Anytime I was heading to do with the park, I always referred to it as the spiritual center of the universe. And for me, it is. And I, this, I just love this place. And I, I've gotten more from it than I could ever give back to it. But it just, it's just paradise. An experienced mountaineer who has been to the summit of Denali in Alaska, Rocky remains Disney's favorite place getting close to 550 ascents in the park. Like I've done Long's 93 times. Long's Peak, the highest mountain in Rocky, poking through the clouds at 14,259 feet. When you push yourself up, trying to find out where your limit is, how, how strong you are mentally and physically, and, and uh, it's amazing, I think, how how much more the human body and mind is capable of than most people think. But it isn't just the physical challenge that attracts Disney to the mountains. It, it makes us realize we're not nearly as important as we think we are. And that maybe it's okay not to know everything. And when you first start to admit you don't know everything, that's the first step toward wisdom. Disney says he finds spiritual renewal while he's surrounded by the spectacular scenery of the park. And as a professional painter, he also finds inspiration. 
you know, I'll see something and maybe you just kind of catch it out of the corner of your eye, and but it sticks, it resonates somewhere in there, and you think about it for a while, and uh, it starts percolating in your head, it starts becoming a painting in your head. Back in his studio, the painting in his head becomes real as his brush dabs oil on canvas. I'm looking at it and thinking, okay, does that look like it felt when I was there? Am I, is the light feel the same as it did when it was beating down on me while I was there? Disney says he tries to capture the mood, the emotion, the essence of the scene. Picasso said one time, a painting is a poem without words. And when you're working on it, it's not a matter of making it look like what you saw when you were there, but more to try and convey to people who are going to look at the painting the feelings that you had when you were there. That's, that's the difference between a camera and a, and a painting. Disney has been painting for half a century now and figures he's completed at least 500 canvases, mostly scenes of the mountains. This painting is uh, the title for it. I love obscure titles and it's called Never Summer Autumn. This is the view from uh, the saddle between Iron Mountain and Thunder Mountain. We went up and climbed Iron Mountain one time a couple of years ago and we were coming down and it's in September, beautiful autumn light. And it's been a windy day so that there was, it created that atmospheric uh, condition where the peaks recede into the haze and uh, just a really pretty September afternoon. For Disney, art is a way to share his love of the mountains with others. I hope that they, they see the beauty of, of nature and the, the importance of nature in our lives and uh, stay connected to places like this so that future generations will, will value this like we do and maybe even more and, and want to protect places like this and, and see that they're preserved for more future generations. That's really important to me. I find that I uh, kind of lose myself in the landscape and uh, you know you get to almost be this godlike uh, creator. Mark McDermott is another artist who finds inspiration in the mountains. And so I guess for me there's there's two things I really like about it. One is being able to combine my love of being outside and hiking and uh, and with painting. That's kind of a killer combination for me. You're forced to work much quicker and looser when you're, uh, when you're outside. Uh, so uh, it helps stretch me a little bit in that direction. McDermott prefers to create his paintings in the open air, despite the challenges of working with watercolors outside. The clouds might be moving shadows and you might have a, a certain view that you really like. And uh, then, you know, five, 10 minutes later, it's changed. And then there's the possibility of rain, uh, wind. I've even had it snow on a painting when I was working near uh, Lake Tahoe. And at first I kind of liked it because the snowflakes, you know, actually uh, watercolorists will drop salt or spray water to get certain effects. And um, I kind of liked it, but then there was so much that the whole thing just ran off the, and I had to give up. 
But McDermott says working outside can produce what he calls some happy accidents. One thing is just uh, the way the paint will mix on the uh, paper, you know, looking at what I've done just here, just laying in the wet on wet. I like to mix colors uh, right, on the, uh, right on the page. And you get all these beautiful little effects that, I mean, you just don't get with, with oil or an opaque, you know, you have to be very purposeful. And, and, and this, I, I love those little happy accidents. McDermott traveled from his home in Alaska to spend two weeks at Rocky Mountain National Park. He was selected to participate in the park's artist in residence program. The artists live in a rustic cabin overlooking Moraine Park, one of the most scenic places in Rocky. The cabin was built more than a century ago and for many years was the summer home of William Allen White, one of the most influential and respected newspaper editors of his time. It was his place of inspiration for writing, um, also for healing, because he also had some tragedies in his life. And uh, it seems very suitable as the park got the cabin that we then made that our place for the artists and residents. And I can't tell you when the artists stay in that cabin, it, it changes them. It's not just the view, it's the energy of the place. You know, William Allen White's desk is there and they get to sit at that desk and connect with the past that way. It's very powerful. Rocky Mountain National Park established the Artists in Residence program in 1984 as a way to honor the legacy of the early artists who played a vital role in preserving the magnificent natural heritage of an expanding nation. You can imagine people back east hearing these stories of these phenomenal sites back west and hard to imagine that those places even existed. So artists of all kinds had a definite impact on the establishment of national parks. They helped promote them, they helped to bring awareness to these areas and actually photographer William Henry Jackson played a vital role because his photographs were taken more seriously than say um, a painting of the mountains or maybe a beautiful description of them so that these were actually given to Congress. They were hanging on the congressional walls, these great pictures, and that helped uh, Congress to be aware of the fact that we did have these magnificent areas and they were, were worth setting aside as national parks. Albert Bierstadt, who is probably best known for some of his uh, uh, some of his Yosemite Valley paintings, actually has two paintings of this area that he came here in 1876 and produced. Uh, so art is really back in the very origins of the concept of protecting this land. I, I would argue that the artists are the people who help to define how everybody else sees the place. In other words, it's the inspiration of the artist to point out the landscape and simply say, this is something wonderful, this is something amazing. And Albert Bierstadt was wonderful at doing that. And since he was one of the first, I would say that there are many artists that have followed in his footsteps. So we have artists in resident programs as a way of kind of honoring and acknowledging the role that early artists played um, with national parks, but also acknowledging artists today come to these places just like you and I do for inspiration. and they reinterpret the meaning and value of these places for the American public. Over the past 25 years, the Artist in Residence program has brought dozens of artists to Rocky where they can work without the distractions of everyday life and fully concentrate on their creative work. Each one brings a unique perspective. Especially Drew Beto, a photographer who can't fully appreciate the scenery around him. I've got no vision in my right eye and 2200 vision in my left eye. Sometimes this is the hardest part of the whole thing for me, is actually getting <coughs> the camera right on the tripod, finding that little, that little hole. He lost most of his sight when a blood vessel in his head ruptured, damaging his optic nerve. I lost my vision quite suddenly in 2002, in November of 2002, and uh, my whole world changed. Um, and eventually I stopped working. I, I couldn't work anymore. And, and I was in a period of pretty severe depression. And I got out my camera, big wooden studio camera and all that, and I was gonna burn it. I was gonna throw it away or burn it or something. But instead of burning his camera and wallowing in self-pity, Beto learned to adapt. 
He found he had just enough vision in one eye to operate a camera using a high-powered magnifying lens to read the light meter and set the exposure. I was just elated. I was, there was something that I could do. And instead of watching Oprah Winfrey in my recliner or something. As he adapted to his limited vision, he learned to look at the world in a new way. Instead of trying to capture the grand vistas of the park, now he focuses on the small bits of beauty that others might miss. I'd like to convey a sense of small beauty uh, about the park. You see all the sweeping vistas and you say, oh, how grand, but there's so much more when you walk up close. It's all right there. And that's the kind of imagery that I'm best at, and I, I hope I hope I can bring some of that to people. And although he can't really see much of the scenery that surrounds him, he loves knowing he is in such a beautiful place. Well, uh, it, there's, there's this feeling of humility. It's so, so gorgeous, it's so large. Uh, I feel honored to be a, a part of walking around in this gorgeous sunshine. Um, you can't photograph the sound of the wind or, or the, the smell of the pine trees. You can't, you know, and, and yet you, you kind of try. Um, you've just got to feel that you're part of something much larger and, and you're not just taking pictures of a flower. You're, you're taking pictures of, of an existence, I guess. Excellent. I saw Coom, heard Coom, held Coom in my mouth, dissolving lozenge of sound in new language with savor and delight, held secret landscapes, meadows exuberant and unseen. Coom had no ordinary vowel, but lush twin valleys where I might choose to live. Once, when we camped in the mountains, we came to a stone room ceilinged in sky. All night, we tossed wildly on sprays of blue and white columbine. There was nowhere else. Poet Veronica Patterson frequently comes to the mountains for inspiration, but she sometimes finds that words are not quite adequate. I actually think sometimes it can be difficult to write about the mountains because they are so magnificent and yet the word magnificent doesn't tell anybody what they are they need to come and see you need to show them you need to climb or walk or be there there's sort of that magical relationship that when we come here we're we can forget ourselves as that individual self who is busy in the world and I think in a sense we then most deeply sense ourselves, you know, who we are. We're glad to be simply um, bodies and lives that get to be here at this time in this beautiful place on the earth. But she also believes artists can help spark a passion for the natural world. In one word I would say we point. We say, look at this. We say or paint or dance something that comes from uh, the land and give other people a chance to uh, look at it in a new way or to look at it freshly as we have just, I hope, looked at it freshly ourselves. Patterson says one of her favorite times to visit the park is in the fall when the elk are bugling, an ancient mating ritual. Every year the elk October, snow curtains a silent meadow, shutting us in where the young bulls rear against each other and the bugles rise, fall, break at the end into pieces. In the car, we drink steaming coffee 
then walk a back road, spot another band, dark shapes at dusk, believed as much as seen. We match strides but say nothing. When one bugle ends in a squeak, we laugh. As we leave, I catch movement. You stop the car. Twelve elk pour across the road, heads turn to our lights, leaping. Seconds later, when we reach the place where land drops away, no sign. Gone, they are ours. Vanishing into the dark, they run through us, a ribbon of elk, twisted once and forever, crossing my mind into yours, yours into mine, breeding the old wonder. To be able to come here every year and hear the elk bugle, it's a way of staying in touch with the seasons, with a world that takes place regardless of you. It's a world of the um, animals and the season passing and to uh, have that every year and come back and just go home with a certain gladness that comes from that. Not everyone, of course, has the ear of a poet or the eye of an artist. Many others are inspired to show their affection for the park through their hard work and dedication. Oh, it's hard work, but uh, it's nice to be up on Trail Ridge Road without having to be driving along and worrying about falling off, and you can just kind of take in the scenery in between shovel loads. And the road hogs are volunteers at Rocky who help maintain the roads that need constant repair because of the harsh extremes of high altitude weather. It's just the camaraderie with the people. Uh, just do it on Monday. I wouldn't do it five days a week, that's for certain. But uh, yeah, one day a week is fun and, and we contribute to the park. They're among hundreds of volunteers who donate their time to keep the park accessible to everyone. Most of us have been visitors to the park for 20 years or more. So uh, you retire, you come here and you do a little, give a little back. Sometimes it's filthy work and sometimes it's very difficult and it takes me one or two days to recover, but uh, it's great, it's, it's a lot of fun. Russ Buckley spends two days each week volunteering in the park, both with the Road Hogs and at the Alpine Visitors Center. You've got about eight or nine miles of mountain driving. Then you'll be in the Colorado River Valley, which is a broad river valley. Here, he patiently gives directions and answers the endless stream of questions from park visitors. And so it's another way of giving back, but I get a lot more than I give, that's for sure. Uh, this is just a fantastic place to be. Like most of the volunteers, Buckley says his motivation is to share his love of the park with the millions of visitors who come here from all over the world. Whether they trek far into the backcountry or just enjoy the scenery from easily accessible overlooks, visitors are often transfixed and sometimes transformed by the experience. It's beautiful. We love the, the uh, scenery and that's what we just up here for is to see it in this first time to see Rocky Mountain National Park. and I've been amazed at it myself. I agree, it's, it's breathtaking. It's not quite a religious experience for us, but just something that is just unbelievable to know that God created all of this and we have the opportunity to be here and see it and experience it. Stephanie and Stacy Smith have been coming here from Missouri every year since their daughters were in diapers. It's just, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's hard to describe. It's just so beautiful and vast and like, you know, you can be in a beautiful valley with elk one minute, you can be within a half hour, you're at 12,000 feet with, you're standing in a cloud. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's hard to explain. The mountains can hold a transformative experience for some people. They go to seek a greater vista. Well, the vista isn't just of scenery, it's of character or it's of future, the future, or it's of meaning, a meaning for life. 
Kurt Buchholz has dedicated his life to helping visitors experience the park. As head of the Rocky Mountain Nature Association for 26 years, he raised funds to build trails and many other projects in the park. To build a wheelchair accessible trail, to fix a historic building, to buy some property, some land around the park, those are all projects that really touch the heart of people. It gives them an opportunity to do something long term, of long term significance for the park. Buckholtz's affection for the mountains began when he was just a young man doing some of the dirty work at Glacier National Park. Because I was a strapping young farm kid and on this crew and knew how to use hand tools, I got the lousiest assignment uh, and that was to dig the pit for the privy. And so it was a very hot day and I had to dig this hole into solid rock with a, with a pick and a shovel. And I was sweating to beat band. And I remember stopping and laying down my tools and just looking up at the mountain. And I can still see it today as I, as, as I think about it and going, man, this is a beautiful place. And yeah, I'm digging a privy, but it's a privilege to be here. <laughs> Buckholtz says it's been rewarding to have a hand in preserving Rocky and sharing the park with visitors from around the world. I always feel better after I've taken a walk in the woods or a, a walk in the mountains. And there's an element, uh, John Muir used to talk about the fact that we could rub off the rust of civilization as we, as we walk through the, go to the mountains and, and um, seek their glad tidings. I find that going up to the high country is um, sort of my, uh, my therapy. It, it calms me down. It makes me feel good about other aspects of, of my life and myself. It's recreation, and it is very spiritual. You get up here and I feel more connected with the earth and then the powers that create the earth and everything else. So it, it is a, a spiritual aspect, and um, just being up here does make you feel better on a day like this. Jim Davidson started climbing mountains as a teenager, and it quickly became his passion. He's climbed some of the highest peaks in the world, seeking both adventure and perspective. And when you're out here, either enjoying it or absorbed in the challenge of climbing a mountain, uh, you don't worry about your to-do list. You don't worry about your retirement money or, or what the economy is doing. You can just really focus on being here with your partners in this environment. And uh, that's both in the really good moments when the magic thing happens, when you see a rainbow or uh, you get to see a great sunset, but also during the intense moments when you must really focus to keep yourself and your partner safe. And so it, it is very intense at times and it's very gratifying because it's, it kind of lifts the day-to-day -day burdens off your shoulders and you can just focus on being here and now. Despite his passion, Davidson almost quit climbing after a terrifying plunge into an icy crevasse on Mount Rainier in 1992. And unfortunately, as I was going along probing with my ice axe, feeling for those soft hidden spots, uh, one of those snow bridges collapsed beneath my feet and dropped me into the crevasse. And since my partner Mike was roped to me, he dug in to slow me down but couldn't stop me in the soft snow. And Mike and I went 80 feet inside a crevasse on the Emmons Glacier on Mount Rainier. His good friend and climbing partner, Mike Price, died in the fall. Davidson needed all of his strength, skill, and determination to make an exhausting climb out of the crevasse. I was devastated at the loss of my good friend and partner, Mike, and I was beat up physically and had some numbness in my arm and spitting up some blood and uh, looking at this climb more difficult than anything I'd ever done before. And I thought at first that I couldn't do it, but I realized that I had to try, and I had an obligation to my partner, Mike, to try to see if I could get him out of the crevasse and back to his family. And, 20 years later, Davidson wrote a book about the accident on Mount Rainier, explaining how he came to terms with the tragedy and why he eventually returned to climbing. Somebody asked me to help lead an expedition of students to Nepal, and I realized I could take my experience of climbing and surviving and help others learn how to be safe in the mountain, and that was what encouraged me to go back and start climbing again. Davidson has become a motivational speaker, using his climbing experience to help others face the challenges of life with courage. So I look back and realize that a lot of what I learned really wasn't particularly about climbing ice walls or using rock climbing gear. It was about resilience and discovering how incredibly perseverant and resilient humans can be, that we can face incredible adversity 
and get through that. So as time passed, I realized that I could make a life of meaning again. And so that's what I do now is I try and share some of those lessons and introduce other people to the mountains. Whether you're a hardcore climber, an artist with a vision, a photographer with hardly any vision, a poet who paints with words, a park ranger, or a dedicated volunteer. Everyone with a love for the mountains finds fulfillment here or inspiration, peace, or perspective.